railroad worker, Lee Bowers, was in the railroad tower here, 14, 15 feet off the ground, had a perfect view of the back of the picket fence area. The parking lot was pretty much full of cars. Mr. Bowers said, while he was switching trains out, this was a, this entire area was railroad tracks and they were switching cars. He was manually switching railroad cars. They were putting them together and then shipping them on down the line. Mr. Bauer said that he saw two cars come in to the parking lot at two different times. One of them was a black and white station wagon. He thinks it was a, he said it was a Pontiac. He testified to the government it was a Pontiac. He said that car drove down the, in, the uh, Elm Street Extension, which is the little half a street there. You'll see it when we walk back that direction. Right there on the other side of where we came in is the Elm Street Extension. He said that black and white uh, Pontiac station wagon drove around the parking lot like it was looking for a parking space. He said <clears throat> it had out-of-state license plate. It had one person in the car, and he had... Uh, either a radio or a microphone up to his mouth like he was talking to somebody. Okay. Well, back in the 60s, we didn't have cell phones, obviously. You don't have, you didn't have phones in your car, so either maybe that person was a policeman or a secret service. There's, there's no way Mr. Bowers could have known who the person was. He said, but that car drove around for a little bit and then it drove out the same way it came in. A few minutes later, Another station wagon came in. It was a light green station wagon. He said that car drove around the parking lot, and that had out-of-state license plates, had one driver in it, and that person on the phone had long hair and was talking on the phone. <clears throat> he said that car drove around. He says I lost. He says in testimony, he says I lost sight of that vehicle. Well, our witness, Ed Hoffman, who we wrote the book about, said that that same vehicle that he saw is the same vehicle that Mr. Bauer saw. He said that car drove through the parking lot and parked on that side of, it, of this railroad switching tower. That's important because later, Ed Hoffman saw the man who was uh, wearing a suit behind the fence fire a rifle at the president, come and get into that Rambler station wagon and drive out of the parking lot. And that Rambler station wagon was seen by five other independent witnesses in and around Dealey Plaza within five minutes of the assassination. I believe that that Rambler was connected to the assassination. Either they were involved in the shooting or they were responsible for getting the shooters out of the area. Mr. Bowers testified to the government that he saw activity behind the picket fence on the north or the south end, which is that direction, the west end, which is that direction, he said he saw two, two people standing at the end of the fence. One had a uniform on, and the other one didn't have a uniform on, but he had matching top and bottom like a shirt and tie, or shirt or sport coat and pants. Ed Hoffman saw the same person, sport coat and pants. Well, Mr. Bowers, after he testified in 1966, because he saw something different than the official version, something suspicious happened to Lee Bowers. He was run off the road in Midlothian, Texas and killed. And in the movie JFK, you'll see that little sequence where he testifies. They ask him the question, okay, thanks for your information. And then the next scene is he's got his face smashed into the steering wheel of his own car, supposedly drove himself. He was so traumatized by the assassination of the events that he killed himself by driving into a brick wall. That's the way I'd do it. It happens all the time. I worked many accidents like that where people would kill themselves by driving into the high speed at a brick, uh, brick into a wall. Yeah. Somebody killed him because he saw something different. So, railroad switching tower, they're in the process, the Dallas County Historical Society is in the process of refurbishing that so that we maybe next year we can go inside there and see the view that Mr. Bowers had. Imagine what it was like 46 years ago standing up there doing your job and not knowing you were witnessing an important event. Mr. Bowers could not hear the shots being fired, but he said something caught his attention over against the fence, a flash of light or a commotion of some kind. He says, the next thing I know, there were people running all over the place. Well, that's almost exactly what Ed Hoffman saw and said 10 years later. Ed Hoffman, you can't see where Ed Hoffman was, but you see the cars going both directions on the highway. That's I-35. Well, that's the highway we just got off of. Mr. Ba or Mr. Hoffman was on that side of the highway watching the events, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
This is the west side of the book depository. Seven story, 90 foot square building, the warehouse. The sixth floor, we'll go around the front, but the sixth floor, northeast corner, is where the government says Lee Harvey Oswald fired the rifle three times and shot President Kennedy. Two of those shots hit him in the body. One in the head, one in the back. <coughs> Let's go over to the picket fence. Billboard. Obviously, the billboard wasn't as high as it was then, but that's where Ed Hoffman stood, about 220 yards away. He could see this area behind the picket fence. Cars were parked here, but he could see a man walking back and forth. He said that man had a suit and, and hat and, and pants, dark dark suit, dark pants, and a hat. He said that man walked back and forth along the fence line for several minutes. He said at one point, a person wearing a red plaid shirt, wearing a red plaid shirt, came around the inside of the fence, talked to the man with the suit on, and then walked around back to the other side of the fence. And often said that at some point, a man standing here at this fence walked down the fence line and talked to a man who was standing by one of the railroad switch boxes. The switch boxes are no longer there, but of the three switch boxes, there are real tall pieces of metal that they can open up and manually switch the tracks. There were three of them in a row. 26 feet from the, from the uh, edge of the triple overpass was the first one, and about 12 feet was the second one, and about 35 feet was the third one. Mr. Hoffman said, as he was waiting for the motorcade to show up, he said there was a man wearing coveralls standing by the middle switch box. The middle switch box was about 72 inches tall on top of an 18 inch concrete pedestal. Plenty of height for an average man to stand behind and not be seen. He said the man in the suit walked down the fence line, spoke to the man at the, switch, the middle switch box, they separated, the man in the suit came back to this position and waited. Now, from Ed's position on the highway, he can't see the motorcade coming because the elevation is different. He can't, all he can see is his parking lot. He can't see the street. All of a sudden, Ed Hoffman sees the man in the suit bend over at the waist, come up, move up to the fence, and Ed saw a puff of smoke come out from the tree line. And Ed thought, my God, that guy's smoking a heck of a cigar. As soon as that happened, Ed said the man turned, had a rifle across his chest, and sprinted down the fence line between the cars and the fence. Ran as fast as he could, stopped suddenly, underhand toss to the man who stepped up from the, from the switch box, the man in the switch box with the coveralls, took the gun apart, put it in a canvas bag, and sprinted out of the parking lot towards the north. The man in the suit turned around, adjusted his hat, and casually walked back to the parking lot. By then, everybody was moving into the parking lot to see where the shots had come from. A uniformed police officer, Joe Marshall Smith, testified to the government that when he got around to the picket fence, he said, the first person I saw was a Secret Service man because he had a hat and a suit on. He was heavy set. He said, I asked for identification. The guy reaches in his coat, showed me something. He said, okay, that's good enough for me. He puts his gun back in his holster and he separates. And Hoffman saw that encounter because he said the man suddenly stopped, raised his hands, reached in his coat, showed the man, the police officer something, and the officer put his gun back in his holster and the two of them walked away. The man in the suit then walked right over that green Ranger station wagon parked by the switch by the switching tower, got in it and drove out. Now, 
Ed Hoffman couldn't have seen that encounter of that police officer unless he was there. Unless he was in that position where he said he was. How would he ever make up something like that? I would never know that. You'd have to have seen that yourself to know it. Let's go over where the switch boxes were, and I'll show you the pedestal. This is the first switch box. The first switch box was right here. It was about that tall. The second one was taller and bigger than this one. That's where Ed said that the man stood behind. He stood on that side so that nobody on the, on the top of the overpass could see him. Because he stood with his back up against the, up against the box. And everybody over here is looking down the street. They're not looking at anybody over here. And if they did see somebody in coveralls, they thought, well, it must be another railroad worker. Well, they, they don't care. So, at the time of the assassination, there was a steam pipe, an 8 inch steel pipe that took steam from that building. I can't figure this one out, but it took steam from that building. He said he burnt his leg. So we know the steam pipe was here. Well, how that relates to Ed Hoffman's story is Ed Hoffman didn't know there was a steam pipe. He couldn't tell there was a steam pipe there. All he said, all I know is the man stopped running suddenly. Well, we have pictures of the pipe all the way across the parking lot. It was like a barrier. And it terminated into the ground right on the other side of that blue car there. Purpose of the pipe, I couldn't tell you. I, I still, to this day, don't know what the purpose of the steam pipe is. Why would they would vent steam pipe or steam from that building all the way over here? But that's the way they did. So let's go on top of the overpass. Explain to me how Lee Harvey Oswald, if he had fired a rifle, how how gunpowder smell would come out of the building and then end up on the street down here that everybody could smell it. That doesn't happen. How do you hide in plain sight? What's the best way to do is hide in plain sight? You look like everybody else in the area. You look like a policeman. You look like a civilian. You walk around with a suit and tie. Hell, in the 60s, everybody wore a suit and tie and a hat. Hell, you don't know who the bad guy is. Everybody in this DVD Plaza is a suspect to you prove otherwise. His car, was, his car got stuck in the traffic underneath the underpass, so he got out of his car and walked up here. About that time, the motorcade's coming through, and that's when a shot was fired, hit the concrete, nicked his cheek with some, and caused a superficial laceration on his cheek. But that's where, that's where it struck, right down there on the other side of the, on this side of the, of the uh, curb. About 20 minutes before the assassination, <coughs> an ambulance arrived because of, of a man who had an epileptic or was having an ep epileptic seizure at the corner of Elm and Houston. What's funny about, not funny, but what's interesting about that is the week prior to the assassination, Aubrey Reich, uh, an eyewitness that we've talked to many, many times, was driving the ambulance. He worked day shift. 
Back in the 60s, the ambulance responded from the funeral home, which was about seven, seven blocks from here. He said every day for a week before the assassination, they got a call to come to Elman Houston on a medical emergency. And every single time they got here, there wasn't anybody here. They thought, well, why would, how can we keep going down there? There's never anybody there. The day of the assassination, Aubrey Wright and his partner watched the motorcade go by their location seven blocks from here. Then they get a call of an epileptic seizure. They take the back roads so they won't interfere with the motorcade. They get here. The sirens are going on the ambulance, lights, and everybody thinks, oh, here comes the president. And everybody that's down here moves up there thinking that's where the motorcade's at. So now all the people that were here are out of the line of fire. So they moved all the way up past the steps, theoretically and photographically, the last person on this side of the street is right next to those steps. There isn't anybody down here. So this is an open field of fire. Aubrey Reich says they got there, the man was having an epileptic seizure. What's interesting about the man is that he was wearing camouflage top and bottom in the 60s. That's kind of weird. I mean, you go to Nebraska Furniture Mart and everybody comes from Cabela's and everybody's got camos on them. But back in the 60s, that's kind of weird. So they load him up in the ambulance and they turn the siren on and by the time they get right here, the motorcade's turning off of me onto Houston Street. They were that close to blocking the motorcade. I think there was a reason that that ambulance was called at the last minute. The reason is, if there's an ambulance, Secret Service guys aren't going to drive in front of that ambulance. They're going, oh my God, there's a medical emergency. Let's wait. Now they freeze them all up on Houston Street, kill everybody. Well, they picked the guy up too quick, I think. Got out of the area, here comes the motorcade. Lots of things were planned out. Lee Harvey Oswald, I don't think, planned that. I don't think he was involved in that planning stage. I think that was a plan B. Let's let's stop the motorcade. How's the best way to stop the motorcade? That's the only way that, if I, as a police officer, if I'm rolling along with a guy in my car and there's an ambulance in front of me, well, let's get out and help. I'm going to stop the car. I'm not going to go around. Probably had the road blocked anyway. They only had one lane in the road. <clears throat> I think that was a re there was a specific reason for that to happen. So, building-wise, what you're looking at straight ahead is the courthouse, the old county courthouse. That's where the sheriff's department was. On the day of the assassination, let me just back up. When Hillary Clinton came to Lawrence, Kansas, back in the whatever, 1990, before she got elected to the presidency, or, sorry, Bill got elected to the presidency. Every law enforcement officer within a three-city area was on alert and on duty in Lawrence, Kansas. My job as a counter-sniper was sitting on top of the city hall, and if somebody tried to stop the motorcade going across the river bridge, I was authorized to shoot. Uh, like anybody's going to do that at 70 miles an hour, jump out in front of the car, stop! Yeah. The day of the assassination, though, the only people that were providing any kind of security were the Secret Service agents. They were all in the follow-up car. There were seven of them. Dallas police. This was the end of the Dallas police security right here. One officer here and one officer there. The Sheriff's Department were told not to participate at all in the security of the motorcade. You're just spectators. You just sit out there and watch them wave and watch when they walk by. Why not use them? Why not put them in the crowd? So they're all standing on the front front steps on this side of the building. It's the front of the building. And the, the office, the eighth, the uh, sheriff's deputies all said, hell, when the motorcade turned the corner, he says, I started going back in the building. I, you know, I, I'm done. I don't have to do anything. Then they hear the shots being fired, and all of them come out of the building and run up here behind the pickup truck. Nobody went to the book depository. There were no shots fired from there. The three police officers running towards the sound of the fire, right behind the picket fence, right where these people sit, right where Ed Hoffman sat. That building, the one that looks like an old castle, is the old red county courthouse. 
the turret, the circular part of that building, the, the top, the second floor with the three windows. Jean Hill, a witness to the assassination, she and her friend Mary Mormon were standing about 20 feet this side of that, that second light pole. Mary Mormon was taking pictures. You saw that in the movie last night. She was taking Polaroid pictures. And then she was giving them to Gene Hill. Gene Hill was wearing a red raincoat. Gene Hill ran across the street just like everybody else did because that's where the sound of the shots were fired from. She no sooner got up there when two men in suits grabbed her physically and escorted her back to that room and said, we know you have pictures. We've been watching you. She said they sat up there and this woman told us that these people told her that you only heard three shots, that's it, no more, in the story. She said, hell, they've been sitting up there all day. There was beer and booze and sandwiches. But Casey and I got up there last year, and you can see everything. Oh, it's perfect. It's like it's like a it's like the box box seat at the at the Texas Rangers or at the uh, uh, Dallas Cowboys new stadium. You can see everything. That's the God spot. That's the spot where probably radio communicators were listening and watching and going, "Okay, go ahead, fire. You're all open there." <clears throat> the gray building to the left here of the county courthouse is the jail. The top three floors, you can see, have bars on them. There were captive witnesses in that building. Now, I wasn't the best cop that ever came to Lawrence, Kansas, but if I'm looking at a crime scene and I look up and I go, I wonder if anybody was up there watching out the window, just like they are now. Hi! Why not go up there and ask people, hey, did you happen to see anybody in the building right next to you? Because they're on the same level. They never did. Hell, there's perfect witnesses up there. They're not going anywhere. You know who they are. You got their name and their mug sign. They didn't go up there. And then the red building is the Dow Tex building. That's to the left there. We'll go, when we go down there, I'll show you that. But I believe that's where a shooting team was. I believe a shooting team was on top of the jail. I believe a shooting team was on that side of the, on, on that end of the overpass in the grassy in the south knoll. I believe there was a shooter behind the fence. And I also believe there was a shooter right at the corner of that fence in the concrete. Now whether everybody fired or not, I don't know. I have no way of knowing I wasn't here. But if I was gonna set this up, I would make sure. How's it going? I would make sure. I would make sure that everybody is ready to fire. And then everybody has a security officer with them so that nobody will walk up on them. So you got two people for every shooting team, a shooter and a spotter. The spotter will not only tell everybody else to get away and then say, hey, don't fire, there's a guy coming up, but they would also pick up the ejected round that you fired because you got a rifle you got to get rid of. The original motorcade was supposed to go down Main Street. That's Main Street right out here in the middle. This is Elm. That's Houston. That's Commerce. So you got Commerce, Main, Elm. Houston going east and west. Or north and south. The day of the assassination, all of a sudden now they came down the street, barricades were put up, and the first car driven by the chief of police makes the turn on Houston Street. The other cars just fall along. Chief Curry was in the car week before the assassination with two Secret Service advance unit guys who said, here's the best way to get for us to get from downtown to the trademark. Go right down Main Street. Go ahead and make any turns, you get right out on Main Street, get on the highway, you're boom, you're there. Great, that's what they were expecting. All of a sudden now at 12.30 and 10 seconds, they come to Elm and Houston, or Houston and Maine, they're making a left turn right here. Why didn't the Secret Service agent go, wait a minute, we're not supposed to go this way. Oh, let's just follow everybody else.
So there's a lot of things that are just kind of suspicious and wonderful. And this this white building, that's the. Uh, isn't that the terminal annex? The white building. The terminal annex building. Right okay, here. now what's that one? That's the new courthouse. Yeah, that's the one that was on. That was under construction. There was a worker on the steel scaffold. He said he could look down the, down Houston Street. He said he saw saw one man with glasses and a sport coat running out the back of the building, getting into a car, and the car drove this direction right towards him. By the time. Mr. Uh, Worley got down to the bottom of the, of the scaffold. He says that car turned the corner and went up the side street. You know what kind of car that was? 61 Rambler Station Wagon. Instead of going over this way. Yeah, let's, yeah we're going to go back that way. And then I've got my ground on the Did you talk to him? Yeah, I did. Okay. All right, let's go this way. As close as you can because Mike's going to talk, but he's got a he's got a big voice. But, uh, you know, you guys want to hear what he's saying. And it's, oh, not at yeah, I know it. All right, guys, this is Mike Brownlaw. Uh, Mike was a, a witness down here that day. He was uh, an observer to watch the president. I'll let him tell you the story, but you were 14, 13 at the time. So uh, listen to what he has to say. He just recently got out of the hospital. So Mike is an eyewitness, and he'll tell you where he was standing up there as a 13, 14-year-old young man. Okay? Listen to Mike, Mike Brownlaw. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the red building that you see over there across the street was known as the Dow Tex building. We were standing there on the corner. My grandmother and my aunt and several relatives came down that morning to see President Kennedy. President's car turned the corner where you see the three overhead road signs. He got just about in that position and shots began to ring out in Dealey Plaza. And I'm sure his brother Casey and his, his counterpart there have told you over the years and many other people. Some people say anywhere from two to 14 shots. We'll never know. I don't even go into that. There were definitely more than any three. As the Warren Commission said, there were more than three shots. Now, you also know that shots came from the sixth floor window of the Texas School of the Father. That's true. Shots did come from that window. And I will always believe that one of those shots hit President Kennedy in the back of the head. That's a fact. I'll believe that. Nobody's going to think that from my mind. I've told Brother Casey many years. However, yeah, thank you, sir. However, right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the famous grassy knoll, where you see that big tree right there, that fence. And ladies and gentlemen, the shot that hit President Kennedy in the temple came from that. And when the bullet hit him in the temple, that shot throwed him backwards and to the left where that X is where you see the lamp post there across the street, that's where the rear part of the president's head landed in the grass from this shot. So it went about 48 feet backwards to the left, a piece of skull did, and landed over there in the grass. Miss Kennedy climbed out on the trunk of the car, this was first lady, and retrieved the other piece of brain and skull. She done that, she picked it up off the trunk of the car. You see that in the Zabruta film, where our friend here is standing right there, that's exactly where Mr. Abraham Zabruta stood, which is all made of know that. That's, he stood right there where he's standing now. And there was a lady with him named Miss Sitchell, Merlin Sitchell. Well, when Mr. Zapruda filmed all this, ladies and gentlemen, he never had a of night of having uh, what he thought he was going to film that day. He just came to see the president and film the president of the United States. Uh, eventually, he made a lot of money off the film in his seven years of living afterwards. Of course, his family continued to make money. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's in brief, I know the case is kind of on schedule, and that's in brief what I tell, <coughs> that shots came from both directions. It was no one man or one gunman. I will tell you this. Jesus Christ could land right here, right now. I say this, ladies and gentlemen, with my hand to God, and he could snatch life from the witch. I thought a few days ago we had. Uh, no one will ever make me believe that Lee Harvey Oswald fired any shot from nowhere. Oswald shot nobody. He didn't. That's the biggest liar was told in this country. He did not, ladies and gentlemen. He was a patsy. He was set up. He was a scapegoat, fall guy, whatever term you want to use. 
This man right here, ladies and gentlemen, I will always believe that man right there. James Files fired the fatal headshot. That's why I had that picture with me today to show people. And he's still living. He admits it. He tells his story. Whether well, you want to believe it or not, that's everybody's brought. Some people say Lyndon Johnson were involved. Nixon, Bush. I don't know. I, I believe some of those things. But it certainly was a conspiracy. It did not happen the way the Warren Commission said. That's a fact, I think. Casey and I agree on that 190%. So I just try to keep it to a level of keep your mind open in the Kennedy assassination. But I say this to all young people that come here. This was the most tragic event in the history of America. November 22nd, 1963. And in doing so, that's why so many people, 46 years later, come here every year. I've seen it 10, 15 degrees in Dallas, cold with ice, and people be down here on the grass and don't. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, because the American public has never been satisfied with the story that was released by the Warren Report, saying that all Wall didn't. He didn't. Biggest lie ever told. Did not help. Anybody got any quick brief questions? I do. I do. But who was that guy working for? Mafia. Charles Nicoletti. Is he over on that side? No, sir. Yeah, he was right here behind the fence. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the red he mark. for the guy in New Orleans? He knew Carlos Marcello very well. But does he ever say who he's working for? He's under Marcello and Charles Nicoletti. Did he do an interview on television? Yes, sir. Okay, that's for He's online, too. Yeah. Anybody else? Mike, go to YouTube. Maybe I missed it, Mike, but when you were standing here with your aunt, yes, sir. where did you go after the after the motorcade went through? Ladies and gentlemen, when the president was hit in the head, where the big X is, the two shots hit him in the head, and two bullets definitely hit him in the head. Everyone in this plaza, and, and the most amazing thing, just look at the films, ladies and gentlemen, that's all you have to do. I don't ask you to take my word. Look at the film. Everybody in this club ran to the grassy you know, because they knew the last shot came. Didn't matter who was shooting from up there. The last shot came from where? Where did you go, Mike? We, we ran up here. Did you? Yes, sir. Everyone ran up here. What did you see when you got up And when we got up here, there were two men behind the fence. Where you see the big tree there. Right on the other side of the fence, these two men were here, as I've told Mr. Casey many times, with the Secret Service badges saying they were secret service agents of the government. And they weren't. Because if they were, they would have remained. About 25 minutes later, no one was able to find them. But as people got up here, they were saying that they were secret service agents. Yes, ma'am. That's another great question. People always say how many shots were fired. And as I told you as I began, some people will say anywhere from two to 14 shots. I myself, at the age of 13, we all, my family, the people that were standing in this general area where we are, anywhere from seven to 11 shots. I've always said there was at least six shots fired that I heard. Mike, did you see the, did you see the man having a, a medical emergency at the corner? Yes, sir. His name was Jerry Belknap. What was he wearing? Uh, Mr. Belknap had on a kind of tannish jacket, very similar jacket to what I'm wearing right now, but tan in color. And he had on some brown, brownish, uh, sort of like brownish corduroy like pants. Camouflage? Yes, sir. You can say that. Okay. And right where you see that little yellow car, the top of that yellow neon, I believe that's a neon. It might have been a little further down. Come right there. What was he, what, what was he, what kind of medical was he having? He was having an epileptic seizure. And he had, uh, according to records in the story, he did have those quite often. He was, uh, I think he was 20 years old. Did you see the ambulance show up? And uh, O'Neill funeral, uh, O'Neill ambulance coming and picked him up. Yes. Sir. How much time after the ambulance? In fact, they picked him up and backed up, and then came down this way. How much time after the ambulance left did the motorcade show up? Six to seven minutes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Do you know about any previous phone calls about danger? Uh, not phone calls, however. There had been threats made toward Oswald's life after the president was shot. Uh, there had been threats let be known to the Dallas Police Department that President Kennedy was going to be killed. However, they were totally disbarred or ignored or no one paid any attention to 
are, are you asking about the ambulance? Yeah. Well, he wouldn't know anything about that, basically, but uh, uh, but as a researcher, you might. Uh, uh, She's asking. Aubrey, Aubrey Wright, who just got out of the hospital, did you know that? Parkland. Yeah, yeah he lost a leg. He, uh, Aubrey was uh, the driver of the O'Neill ambulance, and, and uh, Aubrey told us, and I'm sure maybe maybe said something to you, that he, uh, he said that uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, he received phone calls uh, to come down here. Uh, at about the time that like being on standby. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. In other words, all the first four on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they came down here, and there's nobody here. I don't know if you heard that. Yeah. No, never. He, he said he thought that was. See, so you can learn something 46 years later. That's what I'm saying. And he thought, wow, why? Uh, you know, if they if they yelled and screamed, uh, uh, the idea that you know, screaming wolf. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. No, uh, I've never told anyone that. Uh, some people say they saw a man in the window without without a positive identification. Other people said they saw a head of a man or two men back here behind the fence. One of them known as the bad man. But no, I, I, I never did. But I know shots came from that. What we did see over here, ladies and gentlemen, was a very thin puff of smoke. I'm sure they told you about that. And you've seen the picture of the big puff of smoke. It didn't look like that. No gun, you know, puff of smoke like that. But there was a puff of smoke when the guy fired the shot. However, people had to run up there, and by the time people got up there, the smoke didn't be back there. And a question right here is, where was Kennedy when you heard the first shot? The president, as I first told you, where those three overhead road signs are now, uh -huh. those overhead signs weren't there in 63. About in that area, maybe a little further down. Did you hear? Did you uh, see any sparks when he came when he turned? No. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, let, let me say something to you all real quick. When this happened, from the time the first shot hit in that area, the last shot hit him there, you're talking six seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine this real quick, and we'll let y'all go. If President Obama come around that corner right now, and we're all here and other many, many other people. Everybody's clapping, laughing, shouting. President Obama, you know, jumping up and down. And then all of a sudden, you start having fire go on. Well, you may think it's firecracker. I mean, Casey may think it's gunshot. Don't really know. But it all happens in six seconds. And nobody's going to look to say, well, where did that come from? Or look to a certain place, unless it's just right next to you. Certainly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have to take all of that into account of this. Because this happened in a matter of six seconds. And it was over. There was no way to know where it was all coming from. No. Some of the police officers who were in the motorcade on motorcycles, Officer Hargis being part of the most famous, and he was splattered with the president's brain. Uh, as he's always said, well, I heard the first shot that seemed to come from behind me. But he never mentions the second shot. Oh, you, have you ever paid attention to that? Oh, and he goes directly to the third shot. So here we go. Uh, nobody really knows till this day. And I think Robert's coming now. Uh, he just, <coughs> he just come around? Yeah. <coughs> Before y'all go, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure Mr. Casey told you about him. I think I saw him come around the corner there. Mr. Robert wrote, and I know Marshall. Wrote him. But. Uh, Robert and I have been coming here a long time, and uh, of course he's written many books and trying to finish his current book, uh, Absolute Proof. But Robert and I come here to try to adjust the truth of what really happened here, because it didn't happen the way the Warren Commission said. And Lee Harvey Oswald was set up by the United States government. I'm not making him no saint because he was involved, he knew. But he was set up, he was the patsy. He really was. Do you guys have any other questions? Because at 11 o'clock, we're going to head up to the uh, sixth floor. You're right on at 11 o'clock. We're right on. All right, guys. If, if you wouldn't mind giving Mike a round of applause and telling thank you. And, and I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if you guys want to get pictures with him. We'll give you a few minutes to do so. No problem. Did you went up to the uh, museum up there? Yes. You need to understand that it's not an official museum, it's not a government museum of any kind. 
Uh, did you notice that really what they show up there is the 63 assassination of the 64 Warren Commission. They don't go into any detail about the 70s congressional investigations. They reversed all that nonsense. Um, but since 1978, the federal government says it was a conspiracy, and at least one shot came from right here, the grassy knoll. Uh, I understand your public, text, public school textbook uh, might say the opposite. About 85% of public school history textbooks still ramble on about Oswald and the Warren Commission, even though the federal government reversed that 30 years ago. This concrete structure here goes all the way around the park. It has nothing to do with President Kennedy, as you see, it was here at the time. Um, it's a memorial for George Bannerman Dealey. That's why they call it Dealey Plaza. Uh, Kennedy's memorial is on the other side of the Red Castle-looking courthouse over here. Behind you is the famous grassy knoll. You see how grassy it is? That's because we get about a million visitors a year out here, and everybody wants to stand on the picture and stuff. But that's where about 80% of the witnesses that were out here that day said some of the shots came from, right behind the fence here. Uh, now, these two pictures here were made during the making of the movie JFK, the Kevin Costner movie. Uh, the funny looking guy with the beard uh, might look familiar to you. It's this gentleman right here. He wrote the movie, played four parts in it, uh, was the chief consultant on the film. His name is Robert Groden. And Robert uh, served on every investigation the government ever did on this. I guarantee you the author of your textbook, he never served on one of them. But Robert served on the Church Committee, the Rockefeller Commission, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the Assassinations Records Review Board, every one of them since the Warren Commission. And uh, did a number of things, worked on a lot of the scientific stuff, but he was also the staff photographic consultant for the government. And uh, I'm going to get to that in a minute. The rest of these pictures here, these were all done the day of the assassination. Now this one might like familiar to you. you got a great teacher, I know you do. That's the Zapruder film. And the Zapruder film changed everything. It opened a can of worms that couldn't be shut up again because it showed the opposite of what the Warren Report said that got the case reopened. Now, prior to Robert's release of the Zapruder film, all we had seen this was a couple of single frames in Life magazine. We didn't see the film prior to 1975. That's a long time from 1963. Well, when he showed it on national TV, it shocked Washington so much, they actually invited him up there. He presented it before Congress, and one thing led to another, and the case got reopened by the government. And uh, it lasted almost three full years, hired an army of investigators, and that's a lot different than the Warren Commission. Remember the Warren Commission, President Johnson, this was a president's panel. He simply appointed seven people he knew to look into it for a few months. And by the way, they never hired a single investigator themselves, not one. But anyway, um, this is the Texas School Book Depository right here. That's where Lee Harvey Oswald worked for four and a half weeks before the assassination. And uh, the Warren Commission said all the shots came from this window right here, that square window, second floor from the top, far end window. They called it the sniper's nest. Mm -hmm. And they said all the shots came from there. And that one of those shots hit President Kennedy in the back of his head, killing him right where that X is out there and throwing him violently forward as a shot from behind will do. Would you slap him on the back of the head and demonstrate how he'll... Yeah. See there how they... Oh, I'm sorry, they didn't see that. Would you? No, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, that's how it should work. Okay? I would imagine I'd get thrown violently forward if I was shot in the back of the head. I don't want to find out. But we believed that for 11 and a half years until this gentleman released it, the film, on TV. And it's filmed at 18.3 frames per second. And in less than one eighteenth of a second, instead of getting thrown violently forward like they said he was and like he would be if the shot came from behind, instead, the very next frame shows he's thrown back and to the left, not forward. He doesn't go forward until he bounces off the back seat. Then he comes forward, the next frame. He's thrown from that X towards that light post across the street, back and to the left. Impossible with a shot from behind. If you're shot from the rear, you don't get thrown to the rear. This is the back of the president's skull. Do entrance wounds make little holes or big holes? Little holes. And exit wounds make big holes. It blows everything out the other side. The whole back of the skull, this occipital protuberance right here where you can stick your thumb in that little hole, right above that. That is the occipital protuberance. That whole thing was blown out right where that X is. That's life size there. That's the biggest piece that was blown out back there. And that piece threw, flew back into the left and it landed just to the left of the light post over there in the grass. Again, back into the left. Okay? Again, impossible with the shot from behind. So you got back into the left here. You got back into the left there as well. Even Jackie's up on the back left part of the car grabbing yet another piece of skull. Okay? Busy day, back and to the left everywhere. Jackie was 34 years old, one of the youngest first ladies ever. She climbed up on the trunk of the car, according to her testimony, grabbed a piece of skull about half the size of that one, crawled back in the car, and on the way to the hospital three miles from here, 
on the on the drive, she was trying to put his head back on. She called it his head in her testimony to the Warren Commission. When she got to the hospital, she gave it to Dr. Jenkins. All she could say is, will this help? My point for all that is everything is back and to the left impossible with a shot from behind. If you want to know where the headshot came from, not all the shots, but the one that killed him, just use a little common sense and go in reverse. Start at that light post across the street where the back of the skull and part of the brain landed, and in your mind's eye, come back with a straight line like a bullet flies right through the X where the president was. Keep coming, keep coming. It ends up right here where 80% of the witnesses said some of the shots came from, the grassy knoll. One thing it didn't do was a U-turn back right towards the big, nice orange building. Okay? They don't have those U-turn bullets to protect you. Anyway, when Robert released this on TV, that's when the case got reopened. And uh, three years later, in 1978, the federal government reversed it and said it was a conspiracy. And at least one shot came from there. That's where they've been all these years. I'm not talking about the Discovery Channel or Jay Leno. I'm talking about official history. As I say, Robert worked on a lot of the scientific stuff, but he was also the staff photographic consultant to Congress. It was his job to analyze all the pictures and home movies taken that day. Do you know we never saw 99% of those images? Because President Johnson only allowed the Warren Commission to release 11 pictures in the Warren Report. That's it. The rest, he signed an executive order, said we couldn't see them for 75 years. That's 2039. Do you know what she's going to look like in 2039? She's going to look like this guy. It's a long, long time. <laughs> Maybe without the beard, but you know. He's had lots of accidents. Here's the deal. You don't have to wait that long, folks. And Johnson's dead, for one. But secondly, since it was his job to analyze all those films and pictures, he had to have copies, working copies. He still has them. They never got them back. And he'd like to share some of those images with you. He didn't ask the government to release when he released this. They got the case reopened, the Warren Commission reversed. He's not asking their permission now either. These are free to look at. I know you might have had one already. Some of you, I don't know whether you have or not. But 344 pictures are in here, 300 of which are among those you're not going to see anywhere else in 34 years. It does have the autopsy pictures as well. And the lady complained about those earlier. She said, oh, those are just there for shock value. And I had to explain to her the reason those are in there is the best visual evidence that the headshot came from the front, not the back. Again, big exit going back here, kind of settled that. Have a free look at the magazine if you wish. This gentleman has been an integral part of the investigation since it happened 46 plus years ago. And uh, his DVD documentary has all the films you're not going to see for 29 more years. You've seen this one, and that's great. But guess how many people were filming? There's 122 films on here. There were over 400 people that came out here to see the president. Everybody brought a camera of some kind. They didn't. all wanted a picture of Jackie. But 122 were filming, and they're all on here. If you get this, you get $10 off. And you get the $10 magazine when it's for free also. Anyway, it's all free to look at while you're here, and I do thank you for coming by and remembering Christ. Thank you. Thanks so much. Robert? Guys, the assassination of President Kennedy was a pivotal point in the 20th century. The fact that you're here this many years later, 46 years later, shows how important it was. If you're interested in the magazine, please feel free to have a look at it. These are photographs that are not available anywhere else. If you don't see it here, you may never get a chance to see these pictures again. Thanks for your time. By the way, guys, the uh, the films that we've been watching on the bus, right here. That's what we've been watching. And this right here, we also have, you haven't seen these yet, but these are all the different films other than, well, the Zapruder's on there, but all, all the other films are on there too. And you probably don't know about those yet. So, well, even at 46 years, they don't know. Yeah. About it, yeah. So, thank you guys. And if, and if you guys need anything, go through me, and then I'll, we'll come up and go through here. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Casey. Okay. If you guys ever hear anything at all about what they call the grassy knoll, this is it. This is the famous grassy knoll. You're right in front of it right now. You can turn around and look up. It's an incline. It goes up to a fence line right there. Okay? Now, if you if you look on the opposite side, right over there, you have a grassy knoll over there. You have an incline. And at one time, you had a picket fence, just like the picket fence up here. So what, what you have is a mirror image. Okay? But the famous grassy knoll that they're talking about is this one right here. This is where all the people ran at, right after the shots were fired.
Nobody runs up there except for you have one Dallas police officer that will run inside that building, and, and we'll show you, show you that on the film. Everybody runs up here. They run there, and they run down the fence line over here, okay? All right, now, I'm going to show you a couple things uh, that uh, you do have in your packet. All right, you have a concrete retaining wall right up there. You were, uh, earlier this morning, you saw where Abraham Zapruder was standing. Right behind, behind Zapruder is his secretary, Marilyn Sitzman. She's holding on to the back of his pants because he has vertigo. He loses his balance. So he came out to uh, shoot the film, which is now known as the famous Zapruder film. All right, now, behind that retaining wall that's right there was a park bench. Do you, can you see where that gentleman in that green, blue green jacket is? All right, there was a park bench sitting there. And a little bit, I think I told you a little bit last night and today, a, a black woman and her brother, 23 year old, uh, couple, but they weren't really a couple, brother and sister, they came out about 10 after 12 o'clock, 10 minutes after 12, sat out there and they ate lunch. And they were waiting for the president to come down Elm Street. As they were doing that, they could see Zapruder, they could see Marilyn Sitzman. They could see all the things that took place here. Okay? And she is a brand new eyewitness. Brand new because she's never come forward. In fact, she's never come forward yet officially. We found this out last November from some of our top researchers and some of the people who are working with Robert Grote. She came out here and she talked to Mr. Brownlow. Mike Brownlow, you guys met today. And Mike said that she came out here and she was scared to death to talk about what, what happened. She named and listed all the people who were on the, on the uh, steps here. She told about a, a, an army person who was back here filming. And she, about 10 to 15 feet away, she turned around and she saw a Dallas police officer fire from that fence. She dove on the ground, kicked, kicked a bottle over, broke a bottle, which was that knee-high strawberry uh, drink. And while she was laying on the ground, she could look right through the picket fence and see a gentleman right up here, dressed in blue, shoot the president again. All of those, all of those people she saw, and that is corroborated by people on the triple overpass. Our, our book that we wrote on Ed Hoffman, he's, he's on Stemmons Freeway. He could look back in here and he saw this man. He didn't see the Dallas police officer shoot, but she saw every one of them shoot right here. Those two people, all right? Now, we believe, we believe that obviously that there was a conspiracy, all right? And like uh, Mr. Brownlow uh, said today, I was not down here. I was 13 years old at the time. But I firmly believe that there was a conspiracy to kill the, kill the President of the United States, and there was even a greater conspiracy, which I believe was a conspiracy to cover it up. Now, our United States government covered it up, guys, okay? Cuba didn't do it, Russia didn't do it, the Mafia didn't cover it up, the United States government covered it up. That's where you have to go. They're the ones that covered up and it's covered up today. Now, pretty tough pretty tough to be a, a high school and a junior high teacher and talk about cover up when you're pointing your finger at the government of the United States. Well, where else would you like me to point it? Who did the autopsy? Ru Russia? Cuba? I mean, our government did it, guys. Our government did the autopsy. They were the ones that were supposed to protect it. All right? That's where you have to look. Now, do we have proof that our government killed the President of the United States? No. But they certainly did one thing. They prevented us from knowing the truth for 46 years. Shame on our government. Absolutely. Shame on them. Now, what actually took place here? Well, if you put all the eyewitnesses together and you try to draw from them some basic inferences, what you will find out is bits and pieces of information and you put it all together. And that's what we've been trying to do as researchers for the past 46, almost 47 years. Now, in identifying these witnesses up here, Alice King and her brother Arthur King, who have never come forward, 
now corroborate all of the eyewitnesses together that there was at least two gunmen back there shooting. The problem with all of that is, is that we have films. When you look at the films and you try to figure out what shot hit the president, when the shot or shots hit the president, you do have shots from the front. Several researchers believe that one of the shots hit the president in the front of the head and blew out the back of his head. At the angle of the president's head at the time of that shot, he's downward and to the left. Okay? And when that shot hits him, it hits him from here. Now, I'm not going to say these guys didn't shoot, but that shot, if you're coming down this road, anywhere from 12 to 15 degrees, this is where your math comes in, you start at the top of that hill and start coming down in an F form, and the president is at an angle coming downhill like this, and his head, after, a, after he's already been shot, down to it like this, Geez, would anybody hide in here? <laughs> the very first good. thing that Secret Service personnel do whenever a president comes to any city is they weld these things down. We could easily get in here uh, after November 22, 1963, because a lot of people would come here and pull this thing up. But they didn't start doing that until about 1970. I came down here in 1970, 20 years old, and a guy by the name of uh, Penn Jones Jr., I had read all of his books, he walks with me personally as we walk down here, and I'm, I'm standing here doing this. He grabs a hold of me, he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking on the fence line. He says, for what? He says, for the shooters. Okay, now, let me stop here just for a second. Uh, he walked away. What I wanted you guys to do is turn around and see this guy standing behind the corner of the fence. He, he's real hard to see because he just blends in. All right, and, and, and what I wanted to show you, in fact, you can see him right now walking back there. If he gets close to the fence, you can, you can barely see him. So whoever was behind the fence that day, you have a bright sun. Sun's out. It shines. It's, it's high noon, guys. And the shade up there is going to be really pitch black. Okay? So if, if you wanted to hide in plain sight, like we hid the bus down there in front of you guys, you hide things in plain sight. Put people on the fence line. Who's going to know about it? You got people who are waving down here. Hey, Mr. President, shots. What happened? Okay, how about the little kids with their parents? Do you know what the parents are doing? Not yet. Hey, Jimmy, take a look at the president. Wave to the president. Where's their attention? Look at the kid. Wait to the president. Boom, shots are being fired. Where? Don't let kid down. There are eyewitnesses, there's ear witnesses, there's olfactory witnesses. Okay? Now, number one, I'm not saying the shots came from down here. But if you if you start to look at where the president was hit and the angle and you start putting mathematics together, that shot had to come out of the ground. At least one of them had to come out of the ground. Alright? So I think this is this is a possibility. Could somebody get down there? Well, we were going to pull this up and let Jake get down there. Jake could get down there and hide down there. Okay? David has gotten down there before. Brian has gotten down there before. I got down and I couldn't see. Too short. <laughs> Thanks. But I'm just going to tell you guys, somebody could have been down there. Who's going to look there? And who would look there? Okay? Were there were the people on the fence line? Yes. Was there anybody in here? Don't know. But if you look at the angle of the shot, put your mathematics together, wow. Could have been somebody down here. Now, what we have discovered, uh, probably about four or five years ago, we discovered that there are yellow markers on the concrete over on that side. All right? They're on the curb. And we were trying to figure out why would you put yellow markers on a curb? Anybody know? Why, why would there be yellow markers, yellow paint on a curb? Okay, let's, let's go back again. 
How many of you drive? If you see yellow markers, yellow paint on a curb. No parking. Not kill zones. No parking. You don't want The first thing you have to look at is this. Why would there be yellow stripes on curbs? No parking. Okay? Guys, no parking. Do you see any place where we could park on this road? No place. Why would you put them on there? And why would you just put them on that side? They were on that side. All right? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk walk across the street just as soon as, as soon as we get these cars out of the way. And we're going to show you where they were. And then we're going to show you what they mean, what we think they mean. After this red car, let's go. yellow flex. Okay. Alright guys. We're gonna come repaint one of these days. Alright. Brian's standing right here. Jacob's standing right there. Okay? From here, and, and, and you can see this right here. Dallas, Dallas uh, City did not come back here and paint these ever again. But they were brand new painted that morning, early in the morning on November 22nd. Brand new paint jobs right here. And if you get close enough, you can see the yellow paint. They were sectioned about like this, and they're painted yellow. Which basically means one thing. No parking over here. Why weren't they on that side? Okay, we have five of them, five of them. See where Jacob is? Brian's right here. We start up there, we have five yellow markers, okay? If you have five yellow markers, how many zones do you have? One, two, three, four, four. okay? If the military came out here and marked their zones for shooting targets, that's what you have. All right? Now, let me throw this at you. We went through the Dallas Police Archives and we found that there was a disturbance out here on November 22nd, 1963, at 12 a.m. President Kennedy is going to be killed at 12, approximately 12.30 p.m. Well, what was going on at 12 a.m., 12, 12 hours before? A disturbance. What was the disturbance? Shots were being fired in Dealey Plaza from the picket fence. The police came down here and said, well, somebody's shooting down here. Jeez, what were they doing? Aligning their shots. Painted new curves, aligning their shots. What else would they be doing? I have no idea. I'm making speculation. You put it together. 12 hours before the president is shot, you already have people shooting from the grassy knoll. Then 12 hours later, guess what? You got a dead president here. Now, these these road stripes, these curb stripes weren't dry. It was raining that day. It rained that day until about 10.30, then it cleared off, okay? 66, 68 degrees, and what, what happened? The sun started and the wind blowing a little bit. The wind was blowing about six to eight miles an hour, okay? And started to dry a little bit of this off. But for the most part, bright yellow hadn't dried off yet. Several people walked on them and they got paint on their shoes. They still have those shoes. All right, what does that prove? Well, it proves they stepped in paint, okay? We were gonna make a pretty heavy suggestion that somebody came out and painted those stripes on for a reason. Not to stop cars from parking here, 
but for assassins that are located back there that only that are only going to take one shot in their zones that's exactly what snipers do brian brian was a former sniper so go ahead that's what i did my zone of responsibility is only that wide it's the targets inside or outside of that i can only shoot at what's inside my target my target zone if i don't have a shot in that target zone when he gets out of the zone somebody else is shooting on the Zap Ruder film, we'll show you frames of it. You can see as the limousine is coming down the street, Jackie Kennedy's crawling on the back of the car. You can see yellow painted marks on the sidewalk, or on the, on the curb, clearly marked. The only reason they would be there is for points of acquisition. Teams are responsible for every section. You're responsible for section one, section two, section three, that's it. And they're all on that side of the, of the street, or they're up high. That's why they're painted on the top in the face. So they're painted on somebody can see it from above and somebody can see it from this side. There's none on that side. So that means that tells me that the shooters are all on that side somewhere. Okay. Whatever number of shooters were back there, you've got five stripes, <coughs> four zones. Okay. From the snipers that we've talked to, from the military intelligence snipers of people who have come forward who have told us certain things, this is what they've said. Snipers only take one shot. That's all, need. That's all they need is one shot. All right, they're not going to sit and fire once and then fire again. You get one shot. Comes in your zone. You either have a shot, you either take it or you don't. If you don't take it, then you say, "Hi, hey, I don't have a shot." It goes to the next person. Now, we believe that President Kennedy was hit between two, three, two and three, maybe one, two and three. Okay, didn't need to have anybody else shooting because by the time he got the fatal headshot, boom. We got him. He's done. Let's go. We got to go hide. We got to go you, hide. How would, if, if Casey was one of the shooters, and I'm, let's say, I'm up in the dog spot up here in the building, I'm seeing the entire area. How would I know as a shooter, or if my shooters hit the target, what would I have, what would I have to have to know if my target's been hit? What is it? Some type of signal. Radio communication? That would work, but somebody would go, hey, that guy's got a radio, he must be Secret Service. How about a visual signal? Well, on that side of the street, there was a guy with a black umbrella, it wasn't raining. Standing at the curb was another guy with his arm raised up. So as the shooting began, the umbrella goes up, and this guy's arms go up. And they track the vehicle. Shots are being fired. Once the president's down in the car, the umbrella comes down, the guy's arm goes down. They sit down at the curb, everybody else is running all over the place except them. You've got a picture of that, and when you see the picture of it, not everybody's starting to run yet, but everybody's going to run up that, that and all over there. Except and these them. two guys are going to sit down there and just kind of look at them, and then here's what they'll do. Both of them will stand up after everybody's rushing up there. One will look up this way, one will look down this way, one will walk down this way, one will walk up this way, they're done. If they were witnesses, why wouldn't they have made themselves known? I mean, they were as close as anybody. Can you imagine? Hey, I was right there and this is what I saw. They're gone. They're operatives. They probably were killed the next day. Who knows? In 1977, the House Senate Select Committee said, well, we have the guy with the umbrella. Well, they brought him in, a guy by the name of Stephen Witt. Well, you know what? He brought his umbrella with him. The first thing that they ought to do is check whether or not that umbrella was the umbrella that was in the Zapruder film. He brought a ten-pronged umbrella. The one that's out here is eight. So I'm going to tell you right off, he's a liar. Okay? I don't believe a word he says, and I don't believe anything that the House Senate Select Committee says. That's the government of the United States. They're going to deal with a cover-up, and that's what they've been doing for 46, going on 47 years. How do I know that? I read you need to read. You need to get into your books and you need to read. You need to understand, comprehend. This is 46 going on 47 years old. Okay, now, we've told you about this. We don't know if it's true or not, but I'll tell you what, why would they do that? And why would they never paint them again? I know because the president never came down here again. Well, one thing you have to understand about the possibility of killing somebody like the president you're not going to do this by happenstance. You know, tree mathematics. Here, 125 degree turn. 
Do you think you have to slow down even more so on a 125 degree turn? You got a 6,000 pound vehicle. And these guys, as they were turning, one of the reasons you never see this in the Zepp Ruder film, and if you watch the Zepp Ruder film, the car disappears. It's kind of like, where did it come from? Zepp Ruder started filming, and he, he said he caught it back in here on Houston Street. It's not in the film. We, we automatically were watching here, and all of a sudden, boom, the car disappears. Wow, must have came from space. Boom, disappears. And we have a little girl that's running, and we use her as a geographical locator. As she's running, she runs, and she was getting ready to wave to the president. She stopped, boom, and she's gone too. There are splices in the film. We know there are splices in the film. When we teach at the university level, we tell our students who are going to be lawyers to look for evidence and that they're going to have to write a paper. And the first thing they look at is they say, we're going to take the Zepruder film. And they're excited because they take the Zepruder film and they're ready to write the paper. And then we say, OK, you can write anything on the evidence that you have. And they're excited. And I said, OK, what's your number one evidence? And they go, the Zepruder film. And I go, wrong. They go, what do you mean? Well, has the Zepruder film been altered? Well, yes. <laughs> then it's inadmissible in a court of law. Oh, you got to be kidding me, Mr. Clinton. Nope, then start from scratch. Get something that's admissible. And what would be admissible in the JFK case? The rifle that was found up there? Which one? 6.5 millimeter Mandipur Carcano, 7.65 German Mauser, the British 303 rifle, the pump shotgun found on top of the Texas School Book Depository building roof. Oh, I'm sure a pump shotgun could probably kill JFK from 180 to 160. Anybody use a shotgun? Scattered gun, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, or maybe even the AR-15 M16 that was in the back of the Secret Service car. Anybody see a Secret Service agent with a rifle that day? Okay. There was a Secret Service agent with a rifle that day, and he said he stood up, he got a hold of the rifle because people were shooting. Okay. Anybody? Anybody in the military ever fire an M16? I'm a Vietnam veteran. If you sometimes butt that rifle, sometimes it'll discharge, even if you put it on, you know, lock. It, it, it could sometimes backfire. Well, he said that he thought maybe he might have accidentally butted the rifle to the back of the seat and maybe discharged a round, which actually blew the president's head off. Okay? I want you to look at the angle here. You got two cars following each other. Straight or at an angle? The car is behind him. He's, this is the Secret Service agent in the back seat. In order for him to do what he said he did, the rifle he would have to pick up and what? Butt against the seat like this and what? Kill the Secret Service agent in the front. Kennedy's down here at an angle. He'd have to butt the rifle up against the seat if the seat was up here and make sure it's down at this angle so he hits the president. What a piece of crap. What an absolute lie. What a diversion. Oh, there's a rifle in the back of the car. No, he didn't do that. That isn't how it happened. That's false information. That's a diversionary thing. And how many diversions do we have out there in the, in the last 46 years? Name them. The first, the first big one, Lee Harvey Oswald. Never up there. Did you guys go up there? First of all, how many of you guys went up to the museum today? Did anybody see Lee Harvey Oswald in that room up there? You guys, they've had, what, 10, 15 years to make a, a picture of Oswald. Couldn't they just put it in the window? I've asked them why they didn't. That's why I don't go up there. I get kicked out all the time. Why didn't you put Oswald in there? That's about the only thing they have correct up there. Books are in the same spot, windows there. <laughs> Guess what? Oswald's not there. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Texas School Book Depository Building. You got one thing correct up here. That's why I get kicked out. Oswald's not there. He wasn't there back then. And guess what? Nobody could prove it. But you could ask Oswald, and we did. Where were you, Lee? Well, I was on the first floor eating lunch. I wanted to get something to drink, so I walked up to the second floor to get a Coke. Geez, do we have anybody that will verify that? 
Remember what we told you on the bus today? Yeah. Dallas police didn't say it. We got our man. All right. Now, could there have been shots fired from other other directions? Yes. There's a good possibility that there was somebody up in that corner on that fence. Okay. We have three people at at the doctor's office that say that there was a bullet hole in JFK's left skull. Left. Okay. Here's his right. We have doctors and nurses say that there's bullet holes here, blew out the back of his head. Well, try to place them in the car, in the Zapruder film. But here's the problem with the Zapruder film. It's been altered. So what, what are you going to believe? Do you follow how much this is a mess? That's why people say, well, we'll never find out what it is. Well, FBI destroyed files. CIA destroyed files. And why would the CIA destroy files? Oswald was a CIA operative, Office of Naval Intelligence Agent, FBI informer. Okay, you want to take him up there? Okay, guys, what we're going to do, Brian, follow Brian up there, and, and, and we're going to take you in front of the Texas School Book Depository Building. I know some of you have questions. Hold on to them, and we'll get that this evening, okay? So we're going to move right up there. Follow Brian up there, guys. Months while he was working at the book depository. His wife and daughter lived in Irving, Texas. On the weekdays, he stayed here. That is another story. I don't know why, but it's just interesting. On the day of the assassination, according to the government, Oswald got to this area by cab. The cab drove up the street five blocks, let him out. He walked back the house and walked in and the landlady was watching television and she said she testified that about one o'clock Lee Oswald came in the house I said something to him about you're in awful awful big hurry he didn't say anything he ran or went back to his room he was in there for maybe five minutes while she's watching the television Mrs. Roberts said a police car a marked patrol car the Dallas PD pulled up to the front of the house she thought that was weird. I didn't call anybody. And hit the horn. Hit the horn twice, she said. She looked out and she saw two officers in the car. She thought the number on the side of the door said 1-0, but she may have been mistaken. She said it sat there for maybe 30 seconds. Oswald's still in his room. The car drove away, turned the corner. Oswald comes out carrying or wearing a jacket, a dark colored jacket dark trousers, and he didn't say anything to her. She watched him walk down to the bus stop right there. The bus stop was still there back in 63, and she thought, well, maybe he's, he's busy. I'm not going to pay attention to him. She said it was about 105 when he was out of that bus stop. What's interesting about that is the bus that would have picked him up would have taken him back downtown. Now, he just fled downtown. Why would he go back there? Don't know. The next thing anytime anybody else Next time somebody sees Oswald, or someone who appears to be Oswald, is nine-tenths of a mile away in that direction. At 110, a man rolls up on the scene of the officers being shot. He said, I purposely looked at my watch. It said 110. He says, I got on the radio, on the police officer's radio, and told the dispatcher that a policeman had been hit, been shot out here at Oak Cliff. At 110. So that means that Oswald had to get from here at 105 and arrive at 110, nine tenths of a mile away, walking. Now, normally, what we've had our students do is to get exercise in the morning. That's why we've come out here, but we're not going to do it today. Is we would time everybody walking from 1026 North Beckley to 10th and Patton, which is about nine tenths of a mile. The the overall average time that we've gotten was between 12 and 13 minutes, which which is a pretty good brisk pace. Uh, and I was trying to tell some of you guys today, back in 1963, Jim Ryan, who was a high school student at Wichita, uh, hadn't broken the four-minute mile yet. And that's running. That's world record class. But Oswald, if Oswald left here about 105, 106, and get, he gets there to uh, 110 to kill Officer Tippett, wow, he just set the world record. So timing is, is, uh, is important to try to figure out where people are. Timing is important. Also, the description of the person leaving this room and arriving at the murder scene. 
Mrs. Roberts said he had a dark colored jacket on. Every witness to the murder of Officer Tippett said the man was heavy set and had a white jacket on. Did he change jackets between there and there? I don't know. Oswald certainly isn't heavy set. So the basic contention is if the man can't get from there to there in time to kill the officer, that maybe he didn't kill the officer, maybe he was driven there, or maybe it wasn't him at all. And here, just just to throw more problems trying to understand this, the government's going to tell you that Oswald came walking this way. He had to come walking this way when he's at 10th and Patton. Every eyewitness says he walked this way, in this direction. The government says he didn't come from that direction. They were mistaken. All of the eyewitnesses were mistaken. He had to come from this direction. And I go, great. You're using the eyewitness to say this is what took place, but they're wrong on this part because he had to come this way. He couldn't have come this way. There were, there were four, four credible eyewitnesses who saw or arrived at the murder of Officer Tippett within seconds of the shooting. Not one of those same four people described the same individual. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, in, well, several of the individuals described somebody who looks like me. They said, curly hair. Oswald doesn't have curly hair. All heavy right. set. And heavy set. Uh, Oswald I, I weighed 150 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the whole contention is if, if the guy couldn't get there, maybe he didn't kill Officer Tippett. And Mr. Ellis was asking about why was Tippett killed in the first place? Remember, you've got every officer in the entire city of Dallas responding downtown to the murder of Officer President Kennedy. Every officer was assigned to go downtown to assist, except one officer. Guess which one? Tippett. Tippett was told to go from that part of the, of the city and brought him into this area. This isn't even a normal patrol area. And then within 15 minutes, he's shot and killed by somebody who may have been involved in something downtown. The bottom line is, how do you get how do you get cops from down there out here? You shoot a policeman. They'll drop everything they're doing to come out here and look for the cop killer. So now we've got very few officers downtown. The detectives are in charge of that. Now the patrol officers are running all over the place out here like a bunch of chickens with their head cut off trying to find this average description person who may have or may not have shot a policeman. So this area was completely flooded with cops. And here too... Nothing's downtown. To confuse you even more, uh, the description of the person who supposedly shot President Kennedy goes out at 12.52. Well, let's back up a little bit. The person that gave the description saying that he thought he saw somebody up in the window, gave a description of the person, uh, maybe 140, 160 pounds, slightly balding hair, uh, white male, uh, dis you know, descriptive of the clothing that he had on, and he, he was in Dealey Plaza, and he's looking up, and he says, that's who I thought I saw. Well, he gave that description at 1252, all right? That bulletin goes out at 1244. <laughs> And it was just an average description. Do you guys understand the timing in this? So we have a all points bulletin going out to the Dallas police at 1244 that they're looking for this suspect as described by the person who gave the description at 1252. Here's it a, doesn't make any sense. Here's another thought. If I, if I was Oswald and I just killed the President of the United States, <laughs> would I come back to my rooming house to change clothes? No. I'd be out of town so fast you'd, it'd be a smoke trail. On top of that, not only does he not stop here, but he tells the cab driver, keep on going. Like he's expecting somebody to be here waiting for him. Why, would, why wouldn't you just stop right here and get out? Well, Oswald wasn't in any big hurry to leave Dealey Plaza because he got on a bus and drove two or three blocks on the bus and it got stalled in traffic, so he got off. Nonchalantly, well, okay, I guess we're stuck, so give me a transfer. He goes to the Greyhound bus station, gets in a cab. He starts to get in the cab, and according to the government, a lady comes up and says, hey, can I have this cab? According to the cab driver, Oswald says, sure, here you can have the cab. He's not in any hurry to flee the area. I don't even think he was involved in anything. We're standing in front of 215 West Neely Street in Dallas, Texas. 
This is the home of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and his wife Marina. They lived in this upper floor apartment uh, between March and uh, June of 1963. Uh, the famous backyard photographs of Lee Harvey Oswald were supposedly taken in the backyard of this house by Marina Oswald. Um, the, the photographs show uh, Lee Harvey Oswald holding a rifle, uh, a pistol, two newspapers, and wearing a black shirt and black pair of pants. Uh, one of those photographs ended up on the cover of Life magazine in February of 64, um, showing Oswald with the weapons, and the caption said, the weapons that Lee Harvey Oswald used to kill Officer Tippett and the President. Kent Street. Officer Tippett, according to the witnesses, drove from that direction to this direction. One of the witnesses that the government has is their star witness. <coughs> was right where that red car is, waiting for the traffic to go by so she could go up to Jefferson to catch a bus. Now, the bus that she was going to catch picks her up at 112. So we know it has to be before 112. You all with me so far? Yeah. It has to be before 112. She said she could cross the street because there was a car going this direction and a police car coming this direction. She didn't see anybody walking on the sidewalk at that time. There was a cab driver having his lunch on Pat or on uh, Patton Street, facing that direction in the car having lunch. He said he didn't see anybody walk past him. Officer Tippett drives this direction, stops and talks to a pedestrian who's on the sidewalk. Everybody says he was walking this direction. So the officer is pulling up behind him. He said something to him. According to Mrs. Markham, she said the officer stopped, said something to the, to the man on the sidewalk. The man on the sidewalk stepped off the sidewalk over to the passenger side of the window, put his elbows on the car and said something to the officer. And then stepped back, the officer got out of the car, and before he got to the left front corner of the car, this pedestrian, <coughs> heavy set pedestrian with black curly hair, shot the officer three times over the hood of the car. And as the officer fell down, he walked over to him and put one right in his head. Execution style. Mrs. Markham, oh my gosh, this is a, a horrific sight. She put her hands over her face and screamed, my God, they've shot that man. Really a good eyewitness there. According to the government, Oswald then now takes his gun, walks down the sidewalk, dumping two shell casings out of the revolver. Have anybody ever fired a revolver? <coughs> A revolver has the cylinder with the bullets in it. It will not come out until you open up the cylinder and dump the shells, the spent shells. An automatic will kick the empty shell out automatically. That's the difference. Oswald's revolver has been fired four times. It holds six bullets. The government says Oswald walked down the street, or down the sidewalk, took two shell casings out, walked around the corner in front of the cab driver, took two more shell casings and threw them up in the air, and then reloaded his gun. <coughs> they found two shell casings in this yard, two shell casings around the corner. None of them match the ballistic evidence of the revolver. The first officer who finally showed up here said over the radio <coughs> that the man who shot the officer was probably armed with an automatic. Now, on the bottom of every shell casing, ever manufactured since the beginning of time, says the caliber of the weapon, 38 plus P, 45 auto. It'll tell you the caliber of the gun. Well, the officer who picked up the weapon, picked up the bullet casing, said that the weapon was an automatic and it was 32 caliber. That's a small caliber compared to a 38, compared to an automatic as a 45. Three different different three different versions of the same bullet. Anyway, there was a man driving uh, a, a uh, pickup truck just as the officer got out of the car. He's driving up this direction, sees the officer get shot. He slams on the brakes, 
hides down below the uh, dashboard until the officer ends up where he ends up. <coughs> that off that person described the shooter as heavy set, wearing a black jacket and dark trousers. Mrs. Markham described the man as heavy set, wearing a dark shirt and dark trousers. Two doors down where that big blue dumpster is was a lady standing on the front porch when she heard the shots and she looked up and she saw two men standing over the officer. One was skinny, one was heavy set. <clears throat> the one with the gun, she said, was heavy set and he waved the other one off and they went off in both two different directions. The government never talked to that lady because she saw something different. <coughs> so, this is the crime scene. Uh, not very many witnesses here. We got Domingo, Domingo Benavides was coming up to the thing. Helen Martin was standing on the corner. A man who drove by said, at 110, I got out of the car. I ran over the officer. It was clearly he was dead. I got on the radio and I called the police dispatch and said, hey, there's been a shooting out here, 400 block of East 10th Street. If you ever read the transcripts of the radio conversations between the man who called the police until the officers get here, you wouldn't think that any officer in the city of Dallas knew where the corner block of East 10th Street is. They were driving all over the place. They were everywhere but here. They were over there. They were down down Jefferson Street. They were this direction. They were over on Denver. They went. They didn't know where they were going. In fact, one officer says to the dispatcher, did you say Chesapeake Street, 10th and Chesapeake? There is no Chesapeake in Oak Cliff. There never has been. I don't know how they ever found the guy. So, by the time the first officer gets here, now we won't go there, but right almost diagonally across here, one block, is the funeral home, Dudley Hughes Funeral Home. They get the call that there was an officer been shot and he needs an ambulance. That ambulance got here before any other officer shows up. So by the time the first officer gets here, there's no, uh, there's no officer here. <laughs> there's not even a chalk mark out on the road where the officer fell. Totally screwed up crime scene. I don't know how they ever put that together. But it didn't matter because Oswald had to be the guy. But nobody described Oswald as the one who shot Officer Tippett. So, <coughs> after shooting, uh, shooting Officer Tippett and removing two shells out of his bullet, out of his gun, Oswald walks down the street, down Patton Street, to, to uh, Jefferson, which is the busiest, busiest street in town, and then walks nine, almost a half a mile to the theater. That's where we're going to go next. That's where they captured him. <coughs> okay. This will George Benham and Dean, the Dean Plaza is named after, named after my great grand uncle. So I am a member of the family, about the only one that keeps up with the Janet assassination. On 10-20 on Monday, or Sunday, November 24th, Jack Ruby got a phone call. Let me back up a little bit. The night before, uh, Curry, Chief, Jesse, Chief of Police Curry, told all the news men to go home and get some sleep. Everyone had been up since Friday morning, whatever time they got up normally that day. They've been up all night, the police were tired, Oswald was tired, everyone was tired, all the reporters were tired. They were worried about mistakes. So they told everyone to go home and get some sleep. He told them, if you come back by 10 o'clock in the morning, I promise you won't miss anything. Now, that was not a deadline. He did not say he was going to transfer the prison here at 10 o'clock in the morning. He just said, if you're here by at least 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm not, you're not going to miss anything. At 10.20, Jack Ruby was in his apartment sleeping. He'd been in and out of the police station all weekend. He got a phone call at 10.20 at one of his dances over at Fort Worth. I believe her stage name was Little Lynn. Her name is actually Karen Carlin. Little Lynn was the back part of the left stage. And she did not have rent. She didn't work Friday and Saturday night. She did not have rent to pay to do the rent. It was $25.
Jack Ruby then got in his car with his little dachshund, Bathsheba, and parked in a flat parking lot right over here where this garage is today. It used to look like a flat parking lot just like that. He left his dog in his car and came over here to what used to be the West Union office here in this old Mason building. And he sent a telegram. The telegram was time stamped at 1117. And then he came back out and he looked down and he saw the police department and went back down. He walked down the ramp for 11 minutes and allegedly shot Oswald at 1121, four minutes after the time stamp of the telegram. Now, having said that, there is such a thing as the telegraph um, alibi scam. You can get a form in the old days, you can fill it out, and then have a, you know, talk to the clerk and they can remember you. He won't remember what day of the week it was or anything else. But then if you send a friend back with that form and they have a time stamp, he will think that's when you were there because you've got a time stamp on the telegram and he remembers your face and you showed a photo. I'll leave that for whatever it's worth, pro or con. But there is such a thing as an alibi that you can set up with a telegram by having a friend take one to the telegraph office. He then saw the police station, he decided to go back down and see what's going on, and he walked down here and allegedly went down the ramp. So we'll go down there, then we'll go down the ramp in a minute. Okay, like I said, Jack Ruby took him about four minutes to walk down here and walk down the ramp. Now there was, the building was locked up. Patrick Dean was in charge of security. Patrick Dean was an old friend of Jack Ruby's. Now some people do believe Jack Ruby actually came in an entrance on that side of the building and came down the stairs and across. But Jack Ruby said he came down the ramp. Now there was an officer up here, Roy Vaughn, who was guarding the ramp, making sure no one came down. This is a one-way drive-through. This is the entrance and the exit's on the other side. The exit was blocked by an armored car that they were going to use as decoy to transfer Oswald. There was a lieutenant that had to get out and do some security. He came out the entrance. Roy Vaughn allegedly, according to some, stepped out in the street to stop the traffic to let the car out, and that's when Jack Ruby slipped down the ramp. He also knew the name of the lieutenant that was driving out, so he did see him, but if he crossed in from the other side, he could have seen him as well. Now, in all fairness to Dallas police, they were under orders in the city of Dallas to cooperate fully with the press. In fact, earlier in the year, there was two police officers that did not allow members of the press access to a crime scene, and they almost got reprimanded for it. There was a letter put out, General Order 81 was the cooperation. There was a letter put out explaining to it that it was not a choice of police officers. They must help the press. However, that does not mean they were at all prepared for the rush of the national and international press that they had to deal with. This is a photo of the third floor. You'll notice at least one member of the press using uh, Chief Curry's back as a table while he's writing his notes. I'll pass it around. So they were not used for the rush. And in all fairness, Dow Police, Ruby was in and out of the building off and on all weekend. At least one or two occasions he was asked, what are you doing here, Jack? And he said, I was interpreting for the Jewish press. Um, once they saw him as a familiar face, anyone, whether they knew Ruby or not, might say, yeah, I recognize you from yesterday, you belong here, and let him in. So in all fairness to the press, or the Dallas police, he was a familiar face. Even a lot of the policemen did know him, but most didn't. And so even after a while, he did hang around the police department during the normal year all the time, and he would have also may have been a recognizable face for them. So it's up and down on whether or not the actual property. We're going to go down the ramp a little bit and we'll talk down there. Just got to gather around a little bit. We're not going to go into the building proper. We may go in right in here in this area and that's about it. But we're not actually going to the building because they do have a liability concern and they don't want us roaming around the building at all. But we are going to do right here. Okay, Jack Ruby came down the ramp. There were a ring of police officers around this area and also over in that area. Um, and a live TV camera right there. Two photographers over on that side. This is one of the first pictures taken. This was taken by Jack Beers. He had his camera right over there a little ways. He was up high on top of a van or a car. And he took this picture from right on top of that rail right there behind you. And he took this first picture, which was published in the Dallas Morning News. This is 
Jim Lavelle, he's frowning in this picture because he expected a car to already be backed up and in position. What he was told upstairs was that there would be a car in the position, and if the car had been here, then the members of the press and Ruby could not have stepped forward and gotten close enough to shoot Oswald. But he thought the car was already going to be there. In fairness, if they were using the car as a decoy and they had a live TV camera, if the car had backed down too soon, anyone watching the TV camera would know that that was a decoy. But it came down the last minute. Will Fritz stepped forward, he was in the head of him, and he signaled the car to move in place. But the reason that J.M. Lavelle is frowning right here is because he thought the car would already be in place. He did not see Jack Ruby lunge forward at that point. Now he has Oswald, he's handcuffed Oswald here, and he's got Oswald by the belt with his left hand. He's handcuffed to Oswald's right hand. And so when Oswald, when he did see Jack Ruby out of the corner of his eye, he attempts to pull Oswald behind him. Oswald then twists and gets the bullet right here in his side. It goes all the way and hits every major organ and rests just inside the screen, skin on the back side of his body. Jim Lavelle was trying to pull him put him behind it and he put his front arm around and grabbed Ruby and tried to force him to the ground. This is Detective Graves on the other side in the hat. He also had Oswald, but he had Oswald just by the elbow right here. So basically Jack Ruby was standing right about there. And so as they came down, they came out of this door, they came through the elevator, there's an elevator on the side, you can't see, we're not going to go to it, we're not going to go that far in. Then they went around the little room, the ABC film, you can actually see they were filming through a window there, and they came around the room and came out this door. Will Fritz was in front, he immediately stepped over this way and waved for the car to get in place, and then Graves, Oswald, and Lavelle stepped up. Jack Ruby, like I said, lunged forward. There was a photographer, a press man right here, Ike Pappas, I believe, who stepped forward and said, Oswald, do you have anything to say? Oswald turned away from him and ignored him, glanced at him, looked away like, I'm not going to say anything and then Jack Ruby stepped forward. A lot of people think that Oswald looked and saw and recognized Jack Ruby, but there was a press man, a uh, news uh, member of the press, right there next to him, Mike Pappas with a microphone, who stepped forward and said, Oswald, do you have anything to say? And that's who Oswald looked at, according to some. Other people say he may have recognized Ruby. So basically, he just stepped forward and that's got the shot. So what we're gonna do, since you got a videotape, we're gonna reenact it. Who wants to play Jack Ruby? Anybody? Volunteers? Come on. Come on, guys. You're Jack Ruby. Okay? Stay right here. We lunge forward, take a shot. Who wants to be Jim Lavelle? Who wants to be Oswald? Who wants to be Oswald? Okay. Hold her wrist and don't let go of it. When Jack Ruby lunges forward, you want to actually grab him and try to push him to the ground when Oswald drops to the floor. Who wants to be L.C. Graves? Come here. You hold her. No, you don't have to actually. Just one wrist. Just that one's handcuffed. You just hold her by the elbow. When Ruby comes here, you're going to grab Ruby and try to force away. You guys are come away from that door. So go stand by that door. Who wants to be Will Fritz? Here. Will Fritz. This is Will Fritz. He's the detective in charge of the entire investigation. Captain Will Fritz. Got it? You'll basically lead them out, you go this way. Okay, you guys ready? Now, the rest of your photographers, you're going to be asking, screaming for Oswald. You got any questions? You, need, you know, did you do it? That type of thing. Okay, you guys ready? You'll just step forward, step that way, and then you'll step forward, you'll lunge forward, and shoot at him. Did you kill the president? You did! did, 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 did. <laughs> and then they grabbed him, all the policemen grabbed Ruby and rest him away. They took him upstairs and put him in the same cell that Oswald had just left. <laughs> Ruby was then transferred the ne later that day That's under very, very heavy nice. security and all prisoner holding from that point on changed. Any other questions? Anything else? Jerry, the, the only thing that these doors were not here. These doors were not here, right. right. There used to be doors right here. And that's as far as it went. If you see the ABC movie, the ABC film crew was actually standing down the hall, and when Oswald came forward, he was standing behind it. He's the only one that got Ruby's face. There's a TV special a few months ago, 24 hours, and he was the only one that showed Ruby's face. There was also a reenactment done by Gary Mack at the Sixth Floor Museum with the actual participants, and they also show Ruby's face as he's shooting Oswald. There was a live camera here. There were other film crews throughout. The live camera, I think, was CBS. Could have been NBC. I forget which. Right there. And so everyone watching NBC or CBS saw it live. The rest of them saw a reenactment replay of it. 
Any other questions? Mr. Edward, anything you want to add? No. You guys want to? Corner, dressed in period clothing of that day and going through the motions that President John F. Kennedy did years ago. Uh, I'm quite honored to do that. Uh, it's given me a little bit of local fame to help out on causes uh, worldwide, fundraising and what have you, and doing appearances. But uh, Dallas is a great city. It's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I do want to say a special happy birthday, ironically, to one of the experts out here, Robert Groden, who's on the Grassy Knoll, if you don't know him. Happy birthday, Robert. November 22nd is Robert's birthday, and he's involved in the Kennedy deal, so, I mean, there you go. And I was born the day Marilyn Monroe was killed, so there's another one for you. There's a lot of similarities and a lot of eerie stuff. I just met a gentleman who has a shirt on it said, who killed JFK, and that person's name is Castro, so, and that's a true, that's a true fact. Anyway, folks, I'd like to thank you all for coming out again. It's a great day, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to the gentleman from Lancer for the rest of the event. Great to see everybody, and please get some education while you're out here today, and some respect. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm surprised your neck wasn't kinked from going that back and to the left so many times, man. Uh, now to perform uh, the national anthem, we have a very special uh, lady who is going to perform for you, and uh, we had her uh, do a lot of work this weekend at the conference that we've been holding, and I can tell you she's a very talented lady, and uh, she's a recording artist in her own right. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Kathy Stewart. Thank you. Once again, Kathy Stewart. Google her name. You'll find all sorts of stuff about her, and you'll probably want to buy some of her CDs as well. Uh, next up, I'd like to call upon uh, a lady who is very important in bringing the research community together to sit and discuss, debate, and present the different theories, the different facts about what happened here 46 years ago today. Would you please make welcome uh, the president of uh, JFK Lancer, Deborah Conway. Thank you, Randy, and thank you to all of you fine people that are here with us today. It is beautiful to see you. It's beautiful to see you here to play tribute to our fallen president 46 years ago. In just a little while, at 12.30, we were going to have a moment of silence to help us to remember what happened here. 
What I'd like to do is take just a few minutes to tell you about our organization, JFK Lancer. Lancer was President Kennedy's Secret Service code name. So when we were beginning to gather together to have JFK Lancer, we thought that that would be a, a wonderful and unique way of saying that we don't want secrets anymore. We don't want a secret name, we don't want secret documents, and we don't want secrets on anything. So JFK Lancer became our name and it's our standard and we are open document activists. So what we do, what we're best at is gathering together, reading documents that are released under the JFK Act, interviewing witnesses, doing oral histories, and we get the information together and then once a year we present it. So this weekend was our conference, Friday, Saturday, and this morning, and then the best part is coming out here and gathering together to pay our respects. We have a website, jfklancer.com, that we invite you to take a look through. We have a forum, jfklancerforum.com, that we invite you to participate. We have a MySpace book, uh, MySpace and Facebook, <laughs> and Twitter, we're just all over the internet, and we invite you to please join with us in our goal, and that is to find out the truth and to be able to communicate the truth better. So thank you so much for coming out again, and I'd like to ask anyone who is taking pictures today, if you'll send me copies to my email address, I'd really appreciate it. I'd love to see some of them. Larry's not back. Okay. Um, next, um, Randy's going to introduce someone who's traveled quite a ways, and he's a regular contributor to our conference and our movement. So, Randy. Thank you, Deborah. Um, yes, by all means, a round of applause, not only for Deborah and the work that she does, everybody that works with her at JFK Lancer, it is a lot of hard work uh, to put together a conference like this and to go on their website and go on their forum and post your own view, to post your own evidence that you've discovered is uh, a privilege and an honor and I am proud to have been a part of that. Uh, next up, uh, being one of the researchers uh, who's been, to the, been involved in researching this for many, many years all the way up in Canada, um, I thought coming here to Dallas I might be the one who traveled the furthest to get here, apparently not. This next gentleman, a very well-respected member of the research community, he is a former police officer uh, from England, retired, and he is uh, an author as well, and uh, he has uh, written a very fascinating book from the police point of view, and I'm going to let him tell you more about that. Would you please Make welcome Mr. Ian Griggs. Hello again, everybody. I do this every year. Every year on this day, in this holy place, I'm here speaking to crowds of various sizes. I look forward to the day when perhaps we won't be here on November 22nd, November, that we'll have solved this thing and it will have gone away. With, this is the 46th anniversary, 46 years, and we still don't know. Where is it going to end? Randy, as he says, is from Canada. I'm from the UK. We, ha we have people here from all over the world. Now, let me just go back to what Deborah was saying about JFK Lancer. I'm proud to say that in England we have a group as well. Not as big, nowhere near as big as JFK Lancer. But we have our little seminar every year in Canterbury, a beautiful city in southern England. And we've got dedicated researchers who write and come here. And you see this thing once a year perhaps here in Dallas, Texas. It's going on all the time. We're, we're looking for the truth, reading, writing, speaking, arguing. Yeah, why not? But with these combined efforts across the world, we can hope that the truth will come out. We're getting there. Those of you who are researchers, please continue to dig, research, use primary sources, speak to the witnesses. These people are elderly now. A lot of the witnesses, are, are, we're losing so many of them. Let's speak to them while we can and get, their, get the truth out. Um, I get very emotional when I stand up here speaking like this and um, 
I don't want to. I don't want you to see me cry. So please bear my words in in mind. Let's dig in and let's get to the bottom of this thing. Thank you for listening to me. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Ian Griggs. Looking at the clock, of course, 46 years ago this moment, the motorcade was making its way, heading towards downtown Dallas. One of the nice things about JFK Lancer is that it supports educating the public and uh, making sure that the folks who teach the assassination to their students know what they're talking about. It's very important that uh, people who do discuss it with their students are well educated about it. This year, Lancer presented the 2009 Teacher of the Year Award to a gentleman from uh, Los Angeles. Mr. Glenn Baby. Glenn, come on up. Want to say congratulations and say a few words, sir. It's great to see everybody out here. The deplorable events that occurred here 46 years ago today are a reminder that each and every one of us has a responsibility not only to ourselves but an obligation to educate the students about President Kennedy's assassination. The No Child Left Behind Act focuses on specific standards and subjects that our students should be taught. However, nowhere in the Act does it mention any events pertaining to the assassination. Although President Kennedy's death remains a significant blemish on the history of our great country, it is an event that should not disappear over time. The subsequent cover-up that took place and the suppression of evidence that still exists to this day must never happen again. I am a middle school teacher from Los Angeles, California, where President Kennedy's brother was killed four plus years later. In Los Angeles, it is a forgotten event that is never brought up in casual conversation and more importantly, not taught in our schools. They've now leveled the Ambassador Hotel and it's become a high school. It is imperative that the students of today learn about the assassination and to see what happens when parts of our government are not held accountable for their actions. So I set forth this challenge to all educators across this great land to step up and do all that you can to educate the students as to what happened here on that warm sunny day in November 1963. Remember, the minds that we educate today will become our great leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Glenn. Um, anybody here today that was here 46 years ago? There's a few folks. If you want to come up and say a few words. No, no. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, we appreciate the fact that there were people, and I think there's one gentleman coming up here, but uh, we're going to hold off on that for a bit. Uh, a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Of course, we are here to honor the memory of John F. Kennedy on the date of uh, his passing. We should also remember some of the other people that were involved in this horrific case. Officer J.D. Tippett, who was murdered 45 minutes uh, after the president uh, in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. I think we should also, uh, for those of you who want to debate, uh, either way, uh, one of the most principal characters in the whole case is Lee Harvey Oswald. Of course, he would lose his life two days later. We want to make sure that we remember them as well. Uh, they, they all had families uh, that were very important to them, and so I think we should at least respect their memory as well. Ladies and gentlemen, up next uh, to perform an original song that he recorded uh, for this event and for JFK Lancer, talented uh, singer, songwriter, uh, who's going to perform a song called The Torch is Past. Would you please make welcome Mr. Joey Granati. Give me one second here, guys. First of all, I just want you all to know that uh, I want to thank again JFK Lancer, Deborah Conway, Sherry Feaster. All of the great researchers at this week's conference were amazing, and they all say the same thing. If you want to learn the truth, go online, study hard, and think for yourself. This is for the kids in the audience, because a youth movement is what we need, and it's for all of you.
hopes and dreams awaken within He had charisma and such a bright mind A beacon we thought would never dim But his brilliant flame much too soon was snuffed out A vicious sinkhole on its souls A great future was denied Raise up your fist. We're going to sing a hymn to our fallen leader. We're going to make a video out of this a YouTube. Let's all do this together. Welcome Kathy Stewart, Sherry Feaster. Raise your fists.
How about a hand once again for Mr. Joey Granati for that original song, The Torch is Passed. Uh, 46 years ago, about this moment, the motorcade was approaching Main Street and would make the long drive through the heart of downtown Dallas, in which uh, it was estimated about 200,000, maybe a quarter of a million people got to see the president and gave him a very, very warm reception just minutes before the tragedy that was about to happen. A uh, couple of things I'd like to remind you of, if you're going to be doing any uh, research and looking up stuff on the assassination, if you uh, believe Oswald did it by himself, if you believe that there was a conspiracy, uh, do, I encourage you to do your own research. Don't believe everything that you read uh, and everything that you see. Uh, again, do your own research. As I mentioned, uh, being 46 years ago, for those who might not know, the building over there, the Brook Depository building, is where the uh, alleged shots came from, the sixth floor window. It's now been turned into a museum, and I know that in the last year or so, or several months ago, there were a lot of researchers complaining about how they don't give equal time to the conspiracy theorists, that sort of stuff. And they're saying that it's not an accurate representation of uh, what went on here 46 years ago. I'd argue the opposite, because if you've ever been up there and seen how that window is plexiglassed off, one thing that's not there is the paper bag that the weapon was supposedly carried in. And the other thing, that thing I think accurately depicts is the fact that there's nobody in that sixth floor window doing the shooting. <laughs> Maybe an oversight on their part. Once again, uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, this was begun many years ago by a newspaper reporter from Midlothian, Texas by the name of Penn Jones, and we want to honor his memory as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, ceremony has continued ever since then, and we are proud to be a part of that again. I'd call upon a gentleman to offer a prayer, and uh, he's, he's a gentleman who's uh, not only a researcher as well, but uh, he comes all the way from uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, uh, Mr. Bob Cochran. And after the prayer, I would like to call upon everybody here to bow their heads for a moment of silence to remember the events and the men that died on this date 46 years ago. Actually, I live in Wichita now. <laughs> we gather here from near and far alike to kindle our spirit of hope and freedom. We all struggle as the modern world holds close to passing glory. These are dangerous times we're in. The shadow of death that still lingers here continues to lift high the might and vision of our fallen king. He stands here looking down upon us in incorruptible light. The spirit kindles all great hopes we want to accomplish. Between this world and the next, we all leave behind our best intention. A martyred soul multiplies every value they hold dear a hundredfold. This is proven by our very presence here today. Please bow your heads. O oh, Great Spirit, see our cause as worthy. Bring peace to those wounded souls that died for freedom. Allow the light of Camelot to be so bright it extinguishes the trivial pursuit of small minds that still can't comprehend simple goodness. Let the spirit of youth go forth this day and continue the fight that separates light from darkness. Help us stand here with one voice to lift our hope for peace and freedom to all the world. Let us see the good in each other and never forget that really important things are all around us. Be our faith in humankind so that in thy presence we can find true meaning in love and light. Bless the spirit of John Kennedy 100-fold so that his belief in God and country shade the harshness of our time. Send thy truth before us, Lord, so that our hope of heaven draws us always close to home.
Ladies and gentlemen, again on behalf of JFK Lancer, thank you for attending. Stick around, there's still more to come. Uh, and uh, again, uh, do your own research. I just want to say to anybody who has traveled a fair distance, safe travels on your way home, uh, please again engage yourself in some of the debates. Uh, more people are needed to dig and find the answers to what happened 46 years ago today. Thank you so much for your attendance, and again, more to come. Hello. Oh, and once again, Mr. Ian Griggs. Sorry, we don't have time. This is real quick. I've managed to scrounge an extra minute but just to mention something I forgot before. As always, I've planted several flags down there of countries of where there are researchers um, who are looking into this thing. One flag down there is the flag of the, the country of Denmark. This is in respect of one of our researchers in, the, in our English group who's in the Danish army and is currently in Afghanistan. And we want him to come back. Thank you.